Welcome to lecture four of BIB 102 New Testament survey. Today we're going to start through the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. Let's start by going through the introduction to the Gospel of Matthew. Now while although the author never identifies himself, letter A, we believe this Gospel account was written by Matthew. The reason why this is because the second and generation Christians like Justin Martyr and Papias and Irenaeus and Origen, gentlemen like that who were closer to the times of Christ than any one of us have ever been, they universally ascribed it as Matthew's writing. So let's talk about a couple things about Matthew. Who was he? Well, number one, he was what is called in the Bible a publican. That's just a big word for a tax collector. So because he was a tax collector, there's a couple things we know about him. Number one, that means he was probably wealthy and had really good connections. But also, number two, that also probably meant that he was very disliked by his countrymen. Why? Because none of us like having to pay taxes. Now, if you get money from the government, you are so happy, but that usually doesn't last too long because that also usually means you're giving them money for free to use throughout the year, and then you're just getting that money back that was yours in the first place. So we don't like the IRS. Matthew was probably not a very liked individual. However, Jesus still chose him to be one of his followers. Now, number two, he was one of the original 12 disciples. Now, we commonly will misunderstand all the gospel writers as being at one of the 12 disciples. That is not correct. In fact, we're going to find out that only Matthew and John were one of the 12 disciples. That does not mean that Luke and Mark were not disciples or followers of Christ. They just weren't one of the 12. And interestingly, after Acts 1.13, we actually don't read anything else about Matthew again. Tradition tells us that he served God in the area of Judea for about 15 more years after writing this, and then went out to the other nations to share the gospel, but there is no indication of exactly how he died. Some suggest he died of a natural death, while others say that he was martyred for his faith. Now that we've talked a little bit about who wrote it, let's talk about when it was written. We believe that this gospel was written sometime between AD 50 and AD 70. Then letter C, this gospel account was written to display Jesus as the King of the Jews, the promised Messiah. So A says who wrote it, B tells us when it was written, C tells us why. The Lord has decided to inspire Matthew to write this book to explain to other people, especially the Jews, his audience, that Jesus really was the true rightful heir to the throne of David and the promised anointed one, Messiah of God. And lastly, letter D, we've already talked about this a little bit, but this gospel's key word is fulfilled. And we've already explained this in the other lectures. The reason why this key word is used here is because if Matthew's going to try to write an argument that Jesus really was the prophesied Messiah, then he must show where Jesus fulfilled those prophecies of the coming Messiah. So now that we've uh, finished with Roman rule 1, the introduction to the gospel of Matthew, let's look at Roman rule 2. Unique features of the Gospel of Matthew. Now the next two sections are going to be primarily focused upon details that are contained within the Gospel of Matthew that you can only find there. The first one is letter A. His Gospel account is the only one to use the phrase Kingdom of Heaven. In fact, he uses this phrase 33 times and Kingdom of God only five times. Now without going into great detail about this, many people have incorrectly assumed that there's a difference between kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. But if you compare Matthew 5 verse 3 with Luke 6 20 and you look at those two examples of the usage of kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, they're the same exact illustration being used by Jesus, but Matthew just chooses to use kingdom of heaven where Luke uses kingdom of God. So that shows us those terms are synonymous. Now let's look at letter B. 
his gospel account is the only one to reference the church. He does this in two passages. The first passage is in Matthew 16, verse 18. In this passage, Jesus tells Peter that the church, the ecclesia in the Greek, the assembly of God, will be built upon the confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then it's used in another passage twice in Matthew 18, verse 17, where it's actually talking about church discipline. So what do you do? How do you handle a situation in the church when someone has done something wrong? Well, Jesus gives the example and some instruction in Matthew 18. So that's letter A is only he uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. Letter B, only he mentions and references the word church. And the letter C, his gospel account includes two of the three major discourses. Now, there are three main discourses that Jesus gives in the Bible. And that word discourse is like a big word for a speech or um, a sermon that he gave. The first one's the most famous, number one, the Sermon on the Mount discourse. This is the one that we'll go into a little more detail later, but it talks about, you know, very simplistic information for the people to understand. And it's, it takes place in Matthew 5, through Matthew 7. And then number two, the Olivet Discourse. And the Olivet Discourse is one of my favorites because it pertains to the future, events that will happen in the future that will lead up to Christ's return. Now that is two of the three. The third one is not mentioned in Matthew's Gospel. And in fact, only John records it in John 13 through 17, and that's called the Upper Room Discourse. And that is the speech that Jesus gives his disciples in John 13 through 17 in the Upper Room. We believe most likely Mark, uh, John Mark um, his mother's house in the upper room right before his arrest, betrayal, and crucifixion. Now that we've talked about unique features of the Gospel of Matthew, let's move on to row number three, unique material in the Gospel of Matthew. These are instances that only Matthew records in his account. Letter A, let's talk about some of those unique instances. Number one, only Matthew records the angel appearing to Joseph in a vision. Now, when Joseph discovers Mary's condition, her being pregnant and claiming to be pregnant, you know, of the Holy Spirit, he actually planned on honorably putting her away. What he could have done was brought her before the, the council, had her tried, and even had her punished for what she had done. Thankfully, however, an angel appeared to Joseph and explained to him that her pregnancy truly was a miracle. Because Mary was a virgin, that's the miracle. She had never known a man before, never touched a man before. And the fact that she became pregnant is nothing but a miracle, obviously. But we find out in this passage it was accomplished by the Holy Spirit planting that seed in Mary. Okay? But again, you have to remember, this is not done in any kind of impure way. This is a part of God's handiwork in Him creating something literally out of almost nothing. Only Matthew records the visit of the Magi or the astrologers. Now these wise men, as they're sometimes translated, were literally astrologers. It's the, it's the Greek word magi, and that's where we get the word in the English where we get magic from. Well, what ended up happening was they came from the east to find the king of the Jews. So when they confront Herod about this, this scared Herod because he in this area had claimed himself to be the king of the Jews. So when they come asking where is born this king of the Jews, now Herod realizes there is a threat. So he found out that Jesus from his um, and wise men that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. So then he makes up a story and says, oh, I want you go find him, verify that he's there, come back to me and tell me so I can worship him. And by worship he meant kill. So the Magi then followed the star to Jesus' home and gave him three gifts. Gold, frankincense, which is an incense for burning, and myrrh, which is another perfume. Now, how many magi were there? We do not know. We know that they gave three gifts, but giving three gifts does not demand that there were three wise men. Now let's move on to number three. Only Matthew records the flight into Egypt and the massacre of infants in Bethlehem. Now, when the Magi do not return, Herod becomes angry and orders the death of all Jewish children two years and under in that area. Now, thankfully, Joseph was warned in a dream again by an angel 
to flee to Egypt. And this, in fact, Matthew tells us, fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah 31, 15, that the Messiah would have to go into Egypt and eventually come out of Egypt to begin um, his life in Israel. And number four, only Matthew records the dream of Pilate's wife. This is a really interesting one because in this, in this instance that Matthew records, Pilate's wife goes to Pilate and tells him to have nothing to do with Jesus because she had been tormented in her dreams because of him. Now, unlike a good husband, he does not listen to his wife and it causes a lot of bad things to happen. Which is interesting because if you ever study this passage, it seems like, and it doesn't seem like, there's actually, you can make the case that six times Pilate tried to release Jesus. He did not want to have to kill him. But history was lined up in the perfect way where he had no choice but to deliver Jesus over to the mob to be crucified because God needed that to happen for our redemption. Now, history tells us that Pilate actually did eventually become a believer. Now, that's not necessarily in the Bible. That's in church history, but it comes from credible sources that were only within a hundred years after Pilate's death. And then number five, only Matthew records the remorse and death of Judas over betraying Jesus. So we find out in this passage, Matthew tells us that Judas sorrowed over his decision to betray Jesus and even tried to give back the money. But they would not take the 30 pieces of silver back because it had been used as blood money. So they took that money and did something with it calling purchasing a plot of land and calling it a potter's field where you could bury strangers and John Doe's and things like that. Well, after Judas gives back the money, we know from uh, the biblical story here, he goes and he hanged himself. And eventually, somehow, he fell, hits the ground. Matthew doesn't record this, but he falls, hits the ground, and his bowels gush out. And the Bible tells us that this purchase of the potter's field fulfilled Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13. So that another prophecy that Jesus and his life fulfilled, proving that he truly was the Messiah. Now, number six. Only Matthew records the resurrection of the saints at Jesus' crucifixion. Now, after the veil of the temple is torn from the top to the bottom when Jesus died, Matthew records that many Old Testament saints were resurrected and actually went into Jerusalem and appeared to many people. Now, if you look here on the screen, it only is recorded in two short verses. This is probably one of the most frustrating things to me because literally you have walking zombies going around the city Matthew mentions it, but then just moves on like it's no big deal. That is going to be one of the first things that I want to know when I get to heaven is what happened to them. So now let's move on to number seven, the last one in this section. Only Matthew records the fabrication of the stealing of Jesus' body and the bribing of of the guards. Now the leaders, what they do is they fabricate a story that Jesus' body was stolen by the disciples. This is probably the attempt to be one of the greatest cover-ups in history, but again, what do you expect from people in political positions but to cover up things when something's gone wrong? And the guards are even paid to keep their mouths shut. Now if you think about this logically and apologetically, there is no way to really defend this view because you would have to be able to tell and, and defend to other people that a bunch of, you know, I got a tax collector, some fishermen, tent makers, things like that, just normal, ordinary, everyday people, overpowered, trained Roman soldiers. And not just any Roman soldiers, the Roman soldiers that we study from history that made up this army of Rome were people that were trained from a very young age and they were the best of the best. If they even have tried to take Jesus' body, there is no way that someone would not have been killed in the process. And there's no record of this even trying to happen. And there's obviously no record of anyone dying because of it. So this is just a massive cover-up. But thankfully, Matthew records that cover-up because even today, people try to make that same assertion that, oh, Jesus didn't really resurrect from the dead. His disciples stole his body, which is ridiculous. Now let's look at the last thing we're going to talk about for this lecture, letter B, teachings of Christ unique to Matthew. Matthew.
Now for this lecture, we're only going to focus on one of them, and that is Matthew's recording of the Sermon on the Mount. Now in this great discourse, here are some things that the Lord gives us. One of the things is what we call the Beatitudes, and the Beatitudes is just a big word for state of utmost bliss. This is when Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall have peace. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they'll be comforted. If you look on the screen, there are all the Beatitudes. This was Jesus' way of uplifting those that were downtrodden. And if you know the history of the people he's talking to, he's talking to a Jewish nation under the control of an oppressive Roman Empire. He is trying to motivate them and help them realize that there is hope, that not all hope has been lost, and that they will be blessed in the future. Not only that, but then Jesus raises the bar on the moral standards, where he says, you've heard don't kill. I tell you, don't be bitter, because if you are bitter and angry and hate someone, you are already a murderer in your heart. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, here's where we most likely let believe this is going is because he's trying to let you know and let me know that we'll never murder someone if we don't first hate them or have bitterness towards them. And then another one is he says, you've heard us, you shouldn't commit adultery. Well, I tell you that if you look on a person to lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And again, just like with the murder, if you want to make sure you never commit adultery on your spouse, never lust after another individual that is not your spouse. So then he moves on from that and he talks about proper motives to worship. He tells us to give money to people in secret. Don't announce it. Don't tell everybody you've done it. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand does. In other words, that's obviously hyperbole trying to say, do things so secretively you don't even tell yourself, which is a joke, obviously. Then he says, when you pray, don't pray so other people will look at you and think really cool about you. That's not the purpose of prayer, it's to talk to God. And then if you fast, if you take time not to eat and spend time with God, don't make yourself look horrible and tell people, oh, I'm fasting, so they feel good about you. The purpose of spiritual disciplines is not you. It's about God. And then he gives some cautions. He cautions the people about the love of money. He says, if you love God, you can't love money. And if you love money, you can't love God. You only serve one or the other. And that is a struggle I believe every single one of us go through. And then he tells us, don't worry about things. He says, you don't need to worry about tomorrow because I take care of the animals. I will take care of you. Don't stress about what you're going to wear. Don't stress about what you're going to eat. If I can take care of the animals and feed them and clothe them, I can feed and clothe you. And then the, he says about judging, talks about judging. He warns and says, warns against us judging others when you and I have bigger sins in our own lives. This is that famous passage, don't try to get a splinter out of one person's eye when you've got a big old beam in your own. And the last one I'm going to talk about in this lecture is he instructs them to build their lives upon the foundation of Jesus. He's the rock. This world's pleasures that we, we chase after, that is the sinking sand. And a fool builds his house upon the sand. A wise man builds his house upon the rock. And that rock is Jesus. That concludes lecture four. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or need anything, please do not hesitate to ask. I am always here for you if you need me.